welcome to STEMiverse podcast episode 41. In this episode, Peter talks with Dr. Rebecca Johnson. Dr. Johnson is director of the Australian Museum Research Institute, a wildlife forensic scientist, a conservation geneticist, and co-chief investigator of the Koala Genome Consortium. Rebecca is the first female science director in the museum's 190-year history and is an adjunct professor at the University of Sydney. She and her team were instrumental in establishing the museum as a global leader in the field of wildlife forensics and applied conservation genomics, including developing strong translational research with direct links to industry. She is a member of the Australian Academy of Forensic Sciences and represents the museum on more than 14 government and industry committees. Of Rebecca's many achievements, one that stands out is being one of the inaugural 30 superstars of STEM. This is a group of some of Australia's most dynamic scientists and technologists whose mission is to create role models for young women and girls and working towards equal representation in the media of men and women in STEM. This is STEMiverse podcast episode 41. STEMiverse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for life in a world of radical change and why not abundance. This podcast is brought to you by Tech Explorations, a leading provider of educational resources for makers, STEM students and teachers. For a limited time only, go to texplore.com slash STEMiverse and receive Peter's latest ebook, Maker Education Revolution, a book about how making is changing the way that people learn and teach in the 21st century. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for being on Steadiverse. How are you today? I'm really well. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. I know you're a very busy person. You are, you've got a lot of uh, responsibilities. I think uh, you're traveling overseas um, recently or did you just come back? Um, I, I actually go, am about to go overseas to catch up with my fellow PhD students. We're having a bit of a reunion, so that's a bit of fun, actually. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, But (laughs) but you're right, I do do lots of travel for work. This year, I've actually done quite a lot of domestic travel, but but it's quite common to be invited to give talks overseas, which is a pretty amazing opportunity. (laughs) So, So I do that too. So you are a researcher, you are a director at the Australian Museum, as we're going to go through that a bit later, but you're also a teacher, so you've got students, like PhD students in this case. So you've got a lot of responsibilities, so you're a very busy person. <laughs> yes, all of the above is true and, and it's all wonderful. I, I love it. I feel very fortunate to do the job that I do. <laughs> Great. And you're a superstar as well. We'll, we'll drill into that too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, officially. <laughs> well, could you take a few minutes just to give us a little bit about a little bit of background about you just to set the context for our listeners and then I'd like to ask you about a lot of different things including what is it like to be a director of I think uh, Australia's perhaps oldest museum the Australian Museum yeah yeah that's correct great okay so tell us a few things about you uh yeah so um I as as far as my education goes, I went to the local public school um, mm-hmm. for primary school and um, similarly for high school. So I, um, I'm a big fan of government schools mm-hmm. and I'm very, very pleased with my the opportunities that I got at government schools. Absolutely. Yeah. I um, then was lucky enough to go to the University of Sydney. Um, I had, a, I guess, like all school children, uh, uh, lots of different interests. Um, I actually really, really wanted to be a ballet dancer for quite a few years wow. while I was at school. <laughs> but I can, I can actually remember a very early moment when I did want to be a scientist. But that took me a while to come back to, not, not until I was 
actually deciding to go to university when I thought, actually, I'd really like to do science. <laughs> Can you remember that moment when that spark came in? Yeah, yeah. When I was when I was a young child, I can absolutely remember that moment. Can you tell us what was it like? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to tell <laughs> yeah. you the story. I was a huge reader. I, I loved to read. Um, something I don't have a sadly a huge amount of time to do <laughs> these days. But uh, as a child, I was a voracious reader. In fact, I used to wake up so early in the morning as a very small child, like preschool age. My mum would set me up with um, audio books on the record mm. player <laughs> mm. and I would sit there and listen uh, listen to the audio and follow along with the book. And that's actually how I learned to read. I was I learned to read before I went to school because wow. I, I loved it so much. And when I was around about 11, I remember very distinctly reading a book, which is still one of my favourite books to this day, called Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. Yeah. So it's a child's fiction book written by Eleanor Kerr, um, who's an American author, but it's about a little girl who um, experienced the bomb in Hiroshima, so she's a little Japanese girl, mm. and unfortunately she became very sick with leukaemia. And, and in this book she, she was very sick um, and there was this Japanese um, fable that if you could fold a thousand paper cranes you would be granted one wish, and her wish was to live. And so I thought, wow, what an amazing book. And yeah. it was all about her story as a young girl um, being sick. Um, and at the end of the story, she died. <laughs> and, oh, um, even happy. talking about it now makes me a little quite emotional. But um, yeah. I remember as a child being utterly shocked. Like, this is not the Disney type ending that you're, you, you, you're accustomed to expecting at the end of the book. Normally everything works out fine. Mm. And so I remember being very moved by it and announcing to my parents at the time, I'm going to be a scientist and I'm going to cure cancer because this is such a devastating mm -hmm. outcome and, and what could I do to help? So yeah. that was as an 11-year-old and obviously like all children and, and what is great about all children is that I had so many different interests over the following years that um, by the time I ended up in high school, I loved ancient history. I loved what at the time was three unit mathematics. So, so I did really advanced maths, really advanced ancient history. Um, I threw French in there. And then I decided in year 11 that I, oh, chemistry, I've, I've done enough chemistry. So, so for my HSC, I didn't actually do any science subjects. <laughs> So imagine how challenging that was. Well, actually, I didn't see it as a challenge at all um, when I decided to do science at university and I was accepted into science at the University of Sydney. I then, of course, had to go back and do all these bridging courses to, to learn all the things that I was expected to know as prerequisites. Um, so that's kind of my early education side of things where you know, I suddenly realised I, I really want to do science and then Early in my degree, I uh, was very, very taken by genetics. Um, and so that's what I then focused my, um, uh, my majors on. Um, I was particularly excited by the applied aspect of science mm -hmm. and, and the, the application. So what, what was the real world outcome and what we now call translational science, I suppose. So not so much the theory, but you liked yeah. being involved with experiments and I, chemicals. I think that, yeah. Very much so, yeah. So, so I think the theory is absolutely critical because you need to have strong foundation to mm. apply anything. Um, so the, the strong foundational science is really exciting and, and very stimulating. But for me, I was particularly attracted to things, pr to problems that I could solve with it. And, and I, I actually often think back to uh, Sadako, the book with, with her as the character, and I think, well, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to figure out something that was going to have that kind of outcome. And, of course, I don't do anything like that now. But, but that kind of motivation to translate something into an outcome that I felt was meaningful is definitely wh where I've ended up. Yeah. Um, and so at the University of Sydney, I then went on to do honours with two incredible mentors, Professor Marianne Frommer and Professor John Sved, both wonderful geneticists. And I worked on Queensland fruit flies. So understanding the origin of outbreaks of Queensland fruit flies, which were very, very big at the time, still are, yeah. they're still very economically important. Um, so I was looking at them from a genetic basis of where do, do these outbreaks come from? A, could we pinpoint them with DNA where they were coming from? Because when an outbreak happens in South Australia, for example, that's 
that's absolutely catastrophic for the citrus industry. And so if we could actually find where they were coming from, then that, that would be really, really worthwhile. What we found is that there was no specific signal, which really pointed to the fact that they're being moved around in trucks, like as you would expect, basically. Uh, yeah. So from all of that, what I and the standard what I, what I think is happening is that you are drawn to big problems like being, say, an 11-year-old girl wanting to cure <laughs> cancer, for example. It's, it's not like a small, tiny problem. It's like a big one. Is there a pattern there? And if you think back during uh, your school years as you were jumping in between uh, different interests, let's say, so you had science, you had mathematics, uh, I think ballet was in there as well. Did you see a pattern of being drawn or motivated to solve big problems? I've never thought of that before, Peter, but you're absolutely right. And I even think about what, what drives me today. They, they, yeah. they could definitely be described as big problems. I, it's, look, it's hard to say because I think when you're a teenager and younger, everything seems like a big problem <laughs> yeah. and everything doesn't seem like a big problem because <laughs> you, you're living in your own little world to some degree. But yes, definitely. I've even weirdly as a child, I loved current affairs. I, I loved knowing what was happening on the news and, and, and learning what was happening internationally. And, and I still, if I'm going to binge watch something, it will, it's, it will be something like <laughs> Four Corners, for example, <laughs> which is I've been told is quite unusual. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I, you, you're right. That, that is, um, I, my young years could probably be described like that too. <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty, um, I think that's a, a very good signal because what you're doing now at the Australian Museum, you are the, the first female director of the Australian Museum's Research Institute, right? And as we said earlier, the Australian Museum is, has got a very old history. It's 190 years old, maybe a little bit older than that. And you're the first female director. So uh, I guess there are both big problems that you've got to deal with there because you don't just do museum work, right? You do research as well and a lot of other important work. And the first female, which is an achievement on its own. I'd like to ask you first, what took it so long for the first female director? <laughs> um, but you, you are correct. Uh, we're 191 this year. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, which makes us, uh, we're actually the second oldest scientific institution in the country, which is mm -hmm. pretty special. And the first one, in case you're wondering, was the Botanic Gardens. Um, yeah. So it's very common when humans, they, they move to a new place, they have to understand the flora and they have to understand the fauna. And the, the West or the European way is to, to set up a scholarship framework around that, which is obviously what the museum is, and the Botanic Gardens. Which is also in Sydney for overseas listeners. Yes, yes, that is also in Sydney. So, and we, we date only a couple of decades after the first European settlement mm -hmm. of Australia. So, so we're a very early institution. So there was a bank, there was a school, and, and they set up the museum and the botanic gardens. I am the first ever female director of science. Why, why did it take so long? Yeah. That's a tricky question. Um, because I think you got the job in uh, about a couple of years ago. Was it 2015? Yes, uh, yes, I've been doing it um, almost exactly three years yeah. now, which is very exciting. Interestingly, I, I've been at the museum for more than 14 years, so, so mm. I've had, held a number of different roles during that time and only much more recently did I take on the director role um, and, and being internally appointed in, in our field is, is also quite unusual. So, mm. so it was somewhat of a surprise to get the director role because it was an international field that they, uh, they um, interviewed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to uh, look, uh, my, my director, our, our director of the entire museum, Kim McKay, she's the first ever female to be director. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it took a long time to, uh, to, for, for that to happen. And um, o about one year after she was appointed, um, I became director of science. Um, why do you think it, it took so long? Were the conditions hard? Maybe the candidates were not available? Um, like, I always think about that in a country like Australia, where it is an open democracy, market values, uh, meritocracy as well. It just, it seems like it takes a lot of time for these things to happen. Yeah, look, again, um, these things are always quite complex. There's lots of factors. Mm. And there, then there is the kind of, why didn't this happen sooner? Uh, yeah. When you think about, we, we have previously had very senior females at the museum, which is 
which is actually quite unusual for, for when you look at the statistics across academia. And two of our most senior female scientists, two of our most senior scientists were female, which is, again, uh, kind of really bucking the, the statistics that you hear that it's so, so much in, in the other direction. I think um, museums are quite traditional institutions in that they, they had, had a certain model of, of who they would appoint and in the past, it was actually an internal appointment model. You would be a junior curator and then you would potentially work your way up to a senior role and then, then eventually you were kind of the deputy director and then you would become the director. Right. This is, you know, I'm, I'm talking back in the 1970s, but even, even right through until the 1990s, we had directors that had kind of come up through the ranks and then, then that all changed where the idea of bringing in external talent became much more popular and, and I think that's a great thing. Um, one, my PhD advisor, who I'm happy to talk about a little bit later, he was always a huge fan of bringing in external talent because um, when, when you're doing um, tertiary studies, it's actually quite common to kind of go through the same university you do your undergraduate at, then you do your postgraduate at, and you so you know that you've known that supervisor for a very long time, and that's very comfortable, and there's lots of benefits in that. But there's also lots of benefits in moving, even though sometimes it's a bit scary and really pushes you out of your comfort zone. But he was always a huge proponent of bringing in external talent. Um, yeah, shake the culture a bit, right? Yeah, very much so. And so, so that's something that we saw at the museum. Probably, you know, closer to the 2000s, we had some very fabulous and high-profile directors come in, but that always they had to, there was this expectation they would have a science background. And even that's kind of changed. So my CEO, she, uh, it's actually very hard to say what her background is because she's got an incredibly rich experience across so many different areas. She started Clean Up Australia. She she started the National Genographic Project, with, you know, the, the global DNA study. Mm. But she comes much more from a marketing and a communications background. So, so she's got this incredible skill of being able to, be able to pick out the gold and turn it into something that everyone gets on board with. Right. And so, so someone with that skill set has completely changed our institution and, and made it a really dynamic place where everyone wants to be, but that that kind of skill set wouldn't have even crossed the radars of previous selection panels, I would say. Yeah. As far as the how where, how I fit into that as the first ever female director of science, I, I think it's just unfortunately in that respect it probably did reflect the levels, the numbers of the ratio of male, males to females in senior roles, which are still very low in the STEM area. Right. And so it just took a long time. <laughs> so simple statistics, right? Simple, yeah, yeah it's just not enough. Yeah. So maybe let's get into this topic and uh, talk a little bit about why aren't girls and females uh, in general represented in STEM disciplines as much as boys are? And perhaps what can we do about it? And I know that one of your roles is as a superstar of STEM is to try and promote that aspect in, in, in girls uh, in particular to get into STEM. So maybe talk a little bit first about a couple of root causes. Again, I know it's a complex phenomenon, it's not just one or two things, but maybe a couple of things that we can identify in, in our society, say in Australia, and then look into things that we can do to improve the situation. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so again, that's super complex, and it's also very hard for me to generally say, "Well, girls, girls are X, mm, and that yeah. that leads to Y." Um, <laughs> Where do but, we start, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? I, I would actually even start with just STEM in general, mm -hmm. that perhaps had some um, some PR issues in the mm. past. That it's either it's too hard, or or it's um, it's challenging to teach, or there are no jobs. All of these things can kind of filter down and, and almost become part of the subconscious yeah. so that, that kids go, oh, that's so hard. And, and um, I guess I would say, and particularly for girls, STEM is all about learning to fail. <laughs> it's right. all about learning, to, learning the process but being comfortable getting things wrong. And the reading that I've done in this area, it, it does appear that girls are something along the line happens where girls seem to really withdraw from things where they, they might fail at. Oh, so they're like perfectionists. They, yeah, they don't like to yeah. fail. And it's potentially something that happens 
so early and it's so subconscious it would be hard to even pinpoint what point that kind of starts featuring in small children. But girls don't like to fail and that's a gross generalisation but none of us like to fail. Uh, But I think fostering an environment where that's actually part of the fun and that's part of the the learning process and there's no shame in that I I think is really really important and and you mentioned the superstars of stem program Mm -hmm. it's a wonderful program and I'm so honored to be part of it and it's run by science and technology Australia who have really really um, put a lot of energy into the very big gap with women in stem and the whole point of that is that there are female role models in STEM that you can look at the 30 of us and we're all com- from completely different disciplines, completely different career stages. Some of us are managers like myself. Some of us are mathematicians. Some of us have created entire coding clubs that are now being rolled out to schools. And the whole the point of that is that suddenly, you know, if you ask a child to draw, draw a scientist... They're not just drawing an Albert Einstein-like figure <laughs> in a white lab coat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is, you know, inherently a, um, an older white male. Yep. They suddenly think, oh, that you know, once you see it, you can be it. And because there have been so few role models, and, and there are even stats um, looking at t- Twitter, for example, which is something that scientists use a lot to communicate something like nine, more than 90% of the most followed scientists on Twitter are male. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not, there's plenty of females out there with really interesting things to say. It's just that they don't have much of a voice or, or there's not very many people listening to those voices. And the whole point of the Superstars program is to, to actually highlight that the voices are there and, and they're, they're really cool to listen to. So yeah. here's a variety for you to, to kind of look up and learn what they do. Yeah, I'm looking at the Science and Technology Australia website where it's got uh, a list of the superstars of STEM and there's a lot of diversity there. And uh, I'm looking at the photographs. There's, uh, there's so many different contexts where science takes place. There's a lady there, Dr. Fiona Kilslake. Uh, it looks like uh, a field, I think. Oh, um, she's got yeah, the coolest the job in the world. Yeah. She works on wine. She's the oh, wine scientist. There you go. Yeah, which is awesome. <laughs> this, uh, Dr. Suke, of course, we interviewed her last week uh, next to a humanoid robot. Uh, there's you in a lab. <laughs> with your lab coat yeah. as a bit of a classic science. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, contexts and the, there's a lot of diversity there. It's really worth checking this out, uh, especially if you have girls in your family and you want to, uh, you know, just show them that this is uh, definitely a valid option for your future. I think uh, maybe uh, look into... Um just checking at the time and how many questions I've got noted here. I'd like to ask you, Rebecca, about what your typical day looks like. You, <laughs> you do have a lot of things that you've got to do, a lot on your plate. But maybe walk us through what do you do when you go to work, uh, go to uh, you've got a managerial responsibility, you've got scientific responsibility, you've got students, you've got travel. What does it look like? How hectic is it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's... There is no typical day, almost, <laughs> um, and I guess everyone says that. Um, but it is it, it is pretty hectic. It's as you you say. I'm my primary role is a leadership role, so so I deal a lot with a lot of people. So I I have a lot of meetings, whether or not they're with my own team or if they're they're with externals that are we're partnering with or, or or we're trying to negotiate some kind of relationship with or or they they want us to do something so a big big part of my job is promoting the work of the museum mm. so promoting that the science that we do and reminding people of you know it's very foundational we we are in the business of understanding Australia's biodiversity which is very very important mm. and we do all these cool things with translational things with it and and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit mm. later um, so promoting promoting our, our work is very very important yeah as you say I, I'm invited to travel quite a lot and that might be to present at a scientific conference um, on some of my science work so I, I'm also slotting that into my days where I'm actually an active researcher. I'm supervising students. I've got a wonderful laboratory team that provide a huge amount of support and assistance in that field. But my students are are one of my absolute priorities. 
I, I, the mentoring relationship that you have with them is one of the most important ones that you can possibly have in your entire career. Is that through the University of Sydney? Um, I have a, a couple through the University of Sydney and also one through the University of Technology Sydney. So, oh, so yeah. we're not... I have an adjunct position through the University of Sydney, but I'm, I'm very, very happy to work with students from any of the local universities or, or even abroad, yeah. for much further afield. Um, the, the students that we have tend to spend a lot of time at the museum, but, but there's lots of different ways that you can be a supervisor. So then I also, as far as, as part of my leadership role, I'm also representing my division to our CEO. So um, mm-hmm. if, if there are questions that happen around science, so there's budgets, there's replacement of capital um, items. So in the collection that we have here at, at the Research Institute, we have many, many millions of specimens. Mm-hmm. So our, our, the back part of the museum, if you've ever visited, that you would yep. probably not even notice has got millions and millions of birds and mammals and, and um, insects and snails and, and worms. And so that's a, that's a whole storage issue on its own. <laughs> and so I might be advocating to replace the cabinets for the oh, yeah. um, entomology collection, for example, and negotiating budget for that or um, determining sources of funds. In addition to that, we have lots of priorities at the museum, which are around exploration and discovery, and we do that via expeditions. So, so last year we did a big expedition to Lord Howe Island, mm-hmm. where we did a big broad-scale biodiversity survey of lots of different groups of animals living at Lord Howe Island, uh, and that was very valuable because yeah. we we've been been going. It was the first expedition we ever went on at the museum in the eighteen. So, uh, when somebody visits the museum, there's a lot of specimens. A, yeah. a lot of specimens in uh, in like behind the glass, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to preserve the specimens and replace them over time, and that's also one of your Very responsibilities, so. right? Yeah, very much so. And so so then coordinating some of these big expeditions, which are the discovery aspect of what we do, and another thing that you might find me doing from day to day or uh, whether or not I'm assisting with the oversight of the science or pulling in different groups to do different aspects of the science or, or working on how we're going to fund <laughs> that expedition. Hmm. So talking to sponsors or, or government agencies. And then we're a state government institution, so our minister or our um, our government might be interested in particular things that we have specialty in. Um, so I might be talking to the um, the minister on fish fossils, for example. <laughs> um, so so it's an incredibly <laughs> diverse job that I have. Um, I, I then I sit on quite a number of committees, both for science-related things, but they also might be a little bit more industry-related, so that they could be working with the aviation industry for um, understanding bird strikes, which is, you know, wildlife colliding with planes, or it might be um, working with one of our government um, organisations on how how do we handle genomic data, for example, as as another committee. Yeah, <laughs> so it's very, very broad. <laughs> so you, you never get bored, I suppose, do you? <laughs> no, I never get bored. <laughs> I, I'd like to, uh, just mindful of the time as well, I'd like to ask you a couple of um, science-related questions just to, to drill into the science that you did in your training because that's quite interesting, like uh, conservation genomics, for example, and wildlife, forensics, and then I've got a couple of other questions on uh, how you can be so productive, you know, and focused in your work. <laughs> but let's start with science first. What is wildlife forensics and conservation genomics? Ah, uh-huh, yes. Um, so you were the one that pinpointed my uh, my fondness for big problems, yeah. <laughs> um, which was a great characterisation of what I do. Um, so wildlife forensics is really... Um, like animal CSI, basically. So yep. forensic just means working within the, the restrictions or the expectations of the legal system. So just like the human forensic labs that you might be more familiar with or have seen on TV, mm-hmm. um, you know, even if they're not quite accurate on TV, that you have some idea of the kind of things that are required. Well, wildlife forensics is exactly the same, but it's for questions around wildlife. And those questions are things like illegal wildlife being smuggled into the country to Uh, be sold as pets, for example, or they're smuggled out of the country because Australia's wildlife is 
very um, special. It's we have a lot of unique species here in Australia that that can attract a lot of money overseas in the illegal trade. So wildlife forensics is really the description of doing our applied wildlife science. So which is if if we brought a bird egg, for example we can use DNA uh, to identify what it is, even if it's a tiny, tiny embryo that's mm-hmm. very hard to distinguish from looking at it. Using DNA, we can tell you what it is, Then, and if it's been illegally brought into the country, then the, the agencies involved in that might be able to charge someone with a biosecurity infringement if it's right. something that's potentially a biosecurity pest or an endangered species infringement if it's something that's protected so that's one example. It, it can be much more routine than that. So it, it can be just, you know, I mentioned earlier working with the aviation industry. We work with them practically daily. We'll get specimens sent to us that have been scraped off planes, <laughs> airplanes, you know, yeah. <laughs> or in, ingested. Is if if they're ingested, then then that's usually going to have been a fairly significant incident. Mm. But a lot of the samples that we get were just found on the runway, or or they found a blood smear on the aircraft when it's landed, so they probably haven't even known that they've hit something. Uh, so you need to figure out what it is. And, uh, yeah, exactly. And then, then that's. Mm. Not only is that mandatory for the airports to report something once they've hit it, they also like to know what it was so that they can then make sure that their risk yeah. management procedures are, are suitable for the environment. So so that's um, a much more routine forensic process, but it's exactly the same. And, and the forensic side of that is where we have to, we have all of these very standard procedures that we have to follow. We have to understand what the test is capable of, what it's not capable of. How do we know that we haven't accidentally mixed up our samples? How do we know that there's not contamination? All of those things that if you, if you, you know, were in the unfortunate position to have your own DNA being analysed in some kind of crime or in some kind of potential legal in, implication, you would want to make sure that your samples had been handled yeah. in exactly the same, same way. We do that for wildlife here at the well, museum. So, so let's, let's detective work then for wildlife, uh, which is very similar <laughs> since we're all biology, right, for what you do for, for human cases. Yeah, yeah. It, as far as the um, the actual techniques go, they are very similar. Yeah. The background knowledge is quite different because we're often handed you know, a bird egg or a shark fin or or a gallbladder, the, the mm. range of samples I could we could talk for another hour about <laughs> <laughs> the types of things that we've seen. So we could be handed any one of those things. And we then need to, we have this unknown thing that if we're fortunate, it's a whole animal and then we can, there's reasonable characters that we can start to narrow down what it is. But but often we have no idea. So, So the background knowledge that we have to have is, understanding how animals are related and and so that taxonomic knowledge of the tree of life basically and that's there is no better place than a museum to to understand (laughs) taxonomy (laughs) so so that's why it was a the museums are considered very traditional and foundational scientific institutions but but the wildlife forensics was something that was very translational work that, that I was very enthusiastic to start here and, and is a great, a great synergy with, with the kind of work that we've been doing for 190 years, really. That's great. And, and is uh, conservation genomics and like an associated discipline? Is that why you bundle them together in your case? <laughs> yeah. So for us, again, as a government institution, we are often asked for advice on conservation or understanding different populations of wildlife. So from a genomics perspective, what we're looking at is what is the diversity of this population? I think we we generally agree that more diversity is better because that means you've got more animals in a population that are dissimilar so that if a disease or something unusual starts sweeping through the population, the more dissimilar the animals are, the better chance some of them have of surviving a a catastrophic situation like that. Um, One example that I often use is the Tasmanian devil. Mm -hmm. That Tasmanian devils have been isolated on Tasmania for several thousand years and and as a consequence have really reduced their diversity. So they're they're very similar. And so when something like the facial tumour arrived in that population, they have practically no diversity at their immune genes mm. also. And so 
there was practically no no differences in that population that allowed the animals to respond differently to that disease than the vast majority, which it was su- such a significant disease and, and had such a significant impact on that population. Yeah, almost wiped out, right? Basically, yeah, and, and um, through a huge amount of effort and, and really wonderful science in the conservation genomic space has that species been rescued effectively. Mm. And so that, that, the Tasmanian devil is a great example of conservation genomics because using the, what we know about science and, and genomics, they literally were able to mix and match individuals who are the most different so that they could produce the, the most diverse offspring. Right. Isn't that amazing? So it science is amazing. basically did nature's works just in a much shorter period of time and managed to save the species. Where yeah. you know, Do yeah. you think that if, if you had left it to nature to do this job, um, Tasmanian devils would have gone extinct or survived? What are the chances? Well, um, I think in combination with the facial tumour, um, and this is work that, that colleagues of mine do, we don't really do very much work on mm. Tasmanian devils, in, in the context of the facial tumour, it, it probably would have wiped out the vast yeah. majority of that species. And there were likely to have been pockets in some of the really remote and uninhabitable areas for humans in Tasmania. And those animals may have survived and best case scenario have managed to re-establish themselves as a population. But again, we call that a bottleneck. So when you wipe out a lot of individuals from a population, you're forcing it through a bottleneck where there's not very much diversity. And so what's going to come out the other side... Yeah, you need to have enough individuals. Yeah, you just don't... There's nothing to work with to come out the other side yeah. of that bottleneck. So even had a couple of remnants clung on, then they would potentially have um, been very inbred themselves. And so, so from the conservation genetics perspective, we, we work with the idea that we want to maximise diversity. And so we work on lots of different species, tra- learning that and, and advising on that, basically. Yeah, great. Well, good work. And there's, there's a lot more to be done, right? Isn't just a Tasmanian devil, there's so many species uh, in danger. Absolutely. And what Australia. I would say is let's not get to the point of the Tasmanian devil with yeah. as many species as possible because that was a huge amount of effort and money and time and ongoing ongoing all of the above let's let's try and maintain what we have so that we don't have to keep on rescuing things yeah, at, at exactly. a huge expense um, i'd like to ask you because we just have a few minutes left i'd like to ask you about your productivity habits so um, i'm not sure if you heard about the the highly acclaimed book uh, the seven habits of highly successful people <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I, I read sometimes <laughs> It's a great book. Everybody should read it. Um, what are your habits that make you, um, you know, productive, successful, obviously, but, you know, you have a lot to juggle. Have you over time developed any habits like the ones that um, outlined in the book? Um, I would say yes. <laughs> um, and, and again, this is something that I think about a lot because I wonder, are there some of us that are predetermined to be that way more than others or is it something that you can develop? And I, and I think it's probably a combination. You have to um, be conscious about it, right? I don't think that these things just happen. You need to work on them to make them work for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and perhaps there are some just different personality traits that are much more predisposed to, to these uh, habits being adopted and then amplified, um, but certainly um, being proactive, really, and dogged, and uh, around being proactive, it, it probably would be almost my number one piece of advice. <laughs> it um, reminds me of this many devils uh, situation <laughs> exactly. where just you know it, we left it for too late or not too late. But finally, we we fixed the problem, but uh, we could have done a lot more earlier with a lot less cost. So being proactive just it, helps yes, in so conservation true. and personal life. And, and I think I think about people come to me and they say, oh, you know, this amazing job's come up and um, I don't know if I should apply for it or not. What do you think? And I say, well, if you don't apply for it, <laughs> no one is going to come knocking on your door and offering mm. it to you, are they? So, so <laughs> That's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, I guess that kind of sums up the way that I would go about things. And, yeah. and being proactive is also somewhat a willingness to fail, which is – can be really uncomfortable mm. because, the, you know, when you go out there and go for things, it doesn't always work out. 
and you, you have to be able to pick yourself up. <laughs> Isn't science mostly a failure? Like, you think about it, when you're trying <laughs> to discover something, it doesn't matter whether it's biology, science, physics, uh, and you have to do an experiment to confirm. Like, yeah. Most yeah, of those experiments fact, will fail. One will succeed at the end. <laughs> we, we, once we have a result, we try and break it. We, once we have a yeah. result, we, have to, we <laughs> test it in every other direction. Was so, it a fluke? The, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, yeah, is it, uh, do we come up with some correlation or, or some unfortunate association that isn't actually causative at all. So, oh, so we're, we're yeah, literally arm waving based on, oh, you know, this might be this. So, so yeah, <laughs> so it's very much, um, yeah, proactivity. In my, in my case, it's a, uh, in, in my case where I work with circuits and something works, like I can't believe that it actually works. <laughs> well, this should never have worked. So I've got to try it again <laughs> to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really works. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, it, yes, I, I agree. <laughs> Sometimes it can be an absolute surprise yeah. and it's that eureka moment. <laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, I think <laughs> that's very, very important. Um, and it's also really fun. It's, um, mm. it's, it's all part of the journey. And I guess related to that is having, like, what is, the, what is your goal? What, what is your end goal? Mm-hmm. No, we go. And I, I guess for um, the forensic side of things, I knew exactly what I wanted to do <laughs> with mm. that. I knew exactly why it was important and, and who it would benefit and, and why it was so fabulous for the museum to, to be able to, to do that kind of um, translational work. But when you have an end goal in mind, sometimes you're a little bit impatient because you know exactly what it looks like. But it takes about at least a decade to become an overnight success <laughs> and people just start recognising yes, yes. like, that, that it actually <laughs> exists or that it's successful. So so definitely having an end goal is something that I would certainly um, relate to. Um, I think about, you know, nights on the couch years and years ago when I started working with the aviation industry, which we've been doing for more than a decade now, I would sit there watching watching TV and packing bird strike kits <laughs> to send out to airports. <laughs> and and that, that was really fun. That, that's also a really, a really fun aspect of, of kind of climbing your way towards what your goal is. Yeah, always, uh, you know, be in contact with your goal. Keep always looking at yeah, it. Don't lose yeah. track. Don't get sidetracked. Um, and also... I guess being super passionate about it. I'm, I'm not. I don't think mm. that's on the list of um, <laughs> of, of most um, effective people. But but I'm super passionate about what I do, and I, I feel very fortunate because it, nothing feels like a job when when you you're so really excited to get out of bed in the morning because there's like. 10 different things that are going to be really awesome and, mm. and that you can contribute to and make a difference and you get to work with really amazing people that are really smart and, and all kind of trying to make a difference in their own way. Yeah. Do you think that the fact that you found what you love to do, that might have uh, to do with your experiences uh, in your earlier years where you exposed yourself to a lot of different things that potentially you could make a career out of, right, in the early years at school especially? Yeah, before you commit. I think that's a really good point. I think um, I, I never had any idea what I wanted to be when I grow up, mm-hmm. quote unquote. In fact, I still yeah. don't. <laughs> uh, um, and so, Deve- still developing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, it's, again, something that I often say to kind of PhD students or even students that are thinking about doing PhD, there, there isn't any one particular job that you need to tie yourself into. Mm. And it's more, you know, if, and I've been very lucky that I've been able to follow my passions and I've <laughs> been employed to do so and recognised for it, which is very fortunate. But I believe that if you can find something that you're passionate about, you can make anything your dream job. Mm-hmm. And and I, I often say to students that the first job that I was employed to do at the museum, which was the manager of the genetics laboratory, wasn't anyone's dream job. <laughs> That's so true, yes. It's almost seen as a bit of a, like, oh, you, you weren't going to become an academic at a university. That's it's almost, well, almost could have been considered and probably was by some as a bit of a failure, yeah. Um, so, you know, several years later, people were telling me, oh, you have my dream job. And I thought, mm. well, yeah, actually, the power is in your hands to, yeah. to create your own dream job to an extent. Of course, we all, we're all employed to do something. You can't just be employed to do whatever <laughs> is your own sure. passion. Um, I'm sure there are boring aspects of your job as well. Oh, there are definitely yes. some yeah. routine of parts of the job. <laughs> so keep an eye on the ball, connect the dots from where you are here now to where you want to be and just one step at a time, right? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One step at a time. And I, I suppose around that, I'm a massive list person. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realise right. there were there are list people and there are not list people. And I, I love a list. I, that's, that and is my way of keeping... Lists? Do you use pen and paper or some applications? Yeah, pen and paper. Or, yep. Actually, all of the above. So, <laughs> because if it, it needs to go down, it needs to come out of my head and go and be documented somewhere so that it can then yep. just filter into the workflow. <laughs> and then the list kind of, I always have a list with me. In fact, I'm looking at my my paper one right now. Good list. And, <laughs> and, and um, I guess perhaps this is something to do with being a list person, but I, I love the ability to cross things off it. And, and yes, um, physically right with certain, a pen. Yeah, and there's this certain um, satisfaction in being as efficient as possible and being able to, to work through that workflow and in, in an incredibly efficient way. Nothing beats paper in that. It's so tactile. You make a list on paper. You can, that's what I do right now. I'm crossing out my yeah. questions. <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> yeah. So, so definitely, um, and, and I'm always in awe of people that don't need to take this, don't have lists. <laughs> Um, you know, I was talking to um, Tim Flannery, who, who's mm-hmm. a, you know, a very yep. well-known scientist, former Australian of the Year, and, and we, we have the privilege of working with him on um, a couple of projects at the moment. And I was, we were having a meeting one day and I was writing things down. He's like, oh, you're writing notes. <laughs> and I, like it was such a novelty because I don't think he needs to take notes. Um, uh, but I do. Like, <laughs> yeah, just they can hold it in the head, but I can only yeah. do like three things in my head. <laughs> the rest yeah. is on paper. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so once it gets out of it onto a list, then there's room for new ideas to come yeah. in. <laughs> um, Rebecca, how do you sharpen the saw, as uh, Stephen Covey would say, so the author of The Seven Habits, sharpening the saw means how do you learn new things? How do you get better to things that you need to get better over time? Like you're busy. Uh, how do you find time to, uh, to improve yourself? This is this is one of the things that gets harder and harder the more senior you get mm. <laughs> because you end up with practically no time. But, Do you put time aside perhaps, um, like an afternoon here and there or, or part of the uh, job? I love what I do so much. I actually, when I'm on holidays, I'm usually <laughs> travelling to a conference or, or hmm. ha- having time to write a talk or, or do something that I think is just so much fun but most people think that I'm a bit strange. I think that maybe it's part of my personality that I r- really like to push myself out of my comfort zone and as a result you do that it, it's a way of kind of <laughs> learning by necessity. So, so as far as learning new things goes, I would say I do it by pushing myself to do it. And it's one of the things that I lament or makes me grumpy more than anything, I would say, that I don't have enough time to do that. I'll often say to, to my team, I just haven't had time to think. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, I'll, or I'll end up, I'll have a couple of meetings cancelled and I'll just be wandering around smiling going, I've just had two hours to think, which is <laughs> amazing. But in lieu of all of that, I, I, my place to have great ideas is in the shower. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, yes, that's right. So, that's, so you that's need a waterproof pencil and paper there. <laughs> yeah, for your list. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, um, I, I get that as well. And uh, like the first thing that I do after the shower is to just write it down because, yeah, yes. it, is, it is a quiet time. So <laughs> I make use of it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a common problem. But, you know, sharpening this saw, it, it is one of the habits that, uh, especially if you want to solve big problems and be successful over a sustainable amount of time, is something that you need to integrate with your daily routine. So I'm always interested to know how people do it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, just uh, uh, because uh, we're actually kind of out of time, uh, I only have one more question that I'd like to ask you. And that is, I know that you said you don't read much, but do you have any books that you'd like to recommend people to read? Oh. oh and actually, what would um, you like to read if you did have the time? If I did, so? I, I've got a massive stack of books at home, which which is my, I look at it and I, I say to my mum, I'm going to go on holidays and read, <laughs> read half of that, that pile yeah. of books. And inevitably I'll go on holidays and I'll end up writing a talk or something and she'll say, how did you go one with day. those books? So if I get to read one per holiday, then I'm, mm. I feel like it's some kind of achievement. One of the, the ones I read recently was Inferior, which mm-hmm. is um, a, a very interesting book on women in STEM. 
and uh, written by an author, I think her name's Angela Santini, a British author. And, and it's a really interesting book looking back at why do we think that girls aren't so good at STEM subjects and why do we think that women are, pre- you know, are their brains genuinely different to men's oh, brains yep. that predisposes them to certain achievements? This is not a spoiler to say they're not different. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but she she's done a we fabulous job that. in that book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, she's done a fabulous job of actually going through the particularly Western perspectives on women in STEM and and their different roles in society over the last hundred yeah. to two hundred to, to thousands of years. And where these preconceptions... So social issues, not biological. Exactly, where these preconceptions yeah. crept in and where science was actually supporting these preconceptions by, it, with its own little form of unconscious mm-hmm. bias mm-hmm. where they were going in there expecting a certain result and they saw it, they found it, even though if you gave it to someone else blind, they probably wouldn't find it. And, and so that's a really interesting book that I, I read yeah. um, most recently. Um, how to Clean a Mammoth is the book that I'm reading at the moment, which is... Sorry, how written- to... How to clone a mammoth? How to train a mammoth? How to clone a mammoth? Oh, how to clone? Oh, yes. Yeah, awesome. which, which is a oh, wonderful so book. That. Yes, <laughs> it's a it's a wonderful book written by an, a wonderful scientist who who I, I would proudly call a friend of mine. Her name's Beth Shapiro, and she's a she's an ancient ah, DNA yeah. expert. She, she's a she's an incredibly accomplished scientist, and she's written this Great. book, which is a popular read on if we were to clone a mammoth. Firstly, why would we want to do it? And secondly, how would we go about it? So she steps you through how you would do it from from an expert's perspective but explaining it in terms that anyone could understand. You don't need to be a scientist to understand it. So that, that's what I'm reading at the moment. It's super fun and it's, it's really thought-provoking because it, it really goes into this concept of de-extinction which is um, <laughs> very controversial, bringing things back from extinction. Yeah. It's so interesting as you mentioned that as you were talking about the book and what it's about, one of the questions that I had to ask was uh, whether you'd be able to bring back the Tasmanian Innu, which I think went extinct in the 1800s, according to Wikipedia, but it's okay. (laughs) I'm going to read the book and find out for myself about that. But yeah, uh, my, my son also has very strong opinions about the matter of bringing back extinct animals, especially things like the mammoths and then the dinosaurs. And I'm going to get him this book. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really great read, so I'd absolutely recommend. As far as That's books great. that I just love or have been really important to me, Obviously, Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes that I mentioned earlier, that, that's, some, that's a book I still can't <laughs> read it without crying, um, mm. even you know, many decades on. But that, that's a wonderful book. And it sounds a bit cliched for a scientist, but The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Of course. He, he made such an incredible impact on our field and he didn't get everything right. But, but given what he was working with, he, he was such a... Uh, a thought leader in so many ways. Uh, unfortunately, he think there was no even DNA then. <laughs> exactly, and and things yeah. that he think things that he predicted were only able to be explained decades and decades later through mm. DNA and understanding genetic principles. Um, unfortunately, there there is some documentation of him having some very um, unfortunate correspondence around the, what he thought were the limitations in females and their ability to do science. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so uh, everyone's got their shortcomings, I suppose. Um, oh, he was also like a person of his time as well and uh, like thinking about very what much so. uh, science yeah. was like and then what yeah. society especially, you know, uh, established um, sort of dogma, religious dogma, especially about where life comes from and what the place of a person is, uh, depending e- on the gender, exactly. even race in society. Like, he had to fight against a lot of yeah, misconceptions. Yeah. And, and when you put, when you when you consider that his works in that context, um, he was such a revolutionary um, mm. as far as scholarship goes and 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 under the constraints he he was he grew up in a very religious family um his father was a minister his grandfather was a minister he was a religious man himself and and to be coming up with these ideas he was so conflicted his brain would tell him one thing and his training his religious training would tell him another so to produce that kind of work is, is pretty astonishing still to this day and and finally i would say one of my all-time favourite series of books, it would be the Harry Potter books. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're, they're such... Fantasy. Um, yeah, they're, they're so entertaining and such wonderful stories and wonderful principles and they have 
incredibly strong female characters and education is really important, mm. but being but character is also really important. Um, and, and even when you think about the author of those books, um, mm. she, she story, faced yeah. a lot of adversity to get those books published and, and had to have so much self-belief and, and, and clearly was so talented. I think they're, they're really, you know, people might, might snigger yeah. at them, but but boy, they're they're entertaining books to read. Yeah, it's, it's a classic <laughs> fight between a good and evil. Absolutely. It's always at least part of a good story. So entertainment value very high. Yeah, I yeah, like those. Yeah. I like the movies actually. But, um, I don't have the patience to read the books, but I have enjoyed the movies <laughs> watching it with the kids as well. I have enjoyed both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, last question. I'll phrase it like this. Let's say you could go back in time and. Uh, meet your 12 year old self maybe a little bit you know a, a little bit after you had that uh, science and uh, cancer thing <laughs> and idea w- what advice would you give and, and imagine that like you are 12 years old of course um you need to phrase your advice so that you can understand it back then at that age mm-hmm. uh, what would it be and it could be anything it could be about you know career it could be about how society works uh, it could be about you know how to be successful uh, how to deal in a world that is even still now predominantly dominated by men at least in positions of power what would you say <laughs> Tricky. No pressure. Um, uh, no, no pressure. Uh, well, firstly, I guess I, for me, I'm not a person that has regrets, so it's always it's tricky for yeah. to, for me to to transport my brain back that far. Uh, I, I very much own what I do and I own mm. and whatever the consequences come from that. So that's a good advice, actually. Have no regrets. Yeah. Have no regrets. Absolutely, that would be one of my core principles and one of the core things, the core pieces of advice I would give. But if I was, probably the advice that I would give to myself as t- at 12 um, is something I would give my, to myself still today, yeah. which is believe in yourself hmm. and have the confidence to be yourself. And I, I suppose as a child, I, all, I remember having a completely unshakable self-belief. Mm-hmm. I remember feeling so, I knew what I was about. I knew that I had the brains to do, do things. I knew that what I chose to do would be successful and it would be fun. And, but what was lacking was the confidence. And th- this is th- something that I would say I still have to give myself advice on from time to time because imposter syndrome is something that um, is, is kind of is something that's well discussed that particularly yeah. seems to be common to women where you, you're you always nervous that you're not meant to be there and someone's going to find mm-hmm. you out eventually. I think men have got the same problem too. Um, it's a secret yeah, nobody as I, I've had these uh, conversations with, with my male colleagues too and they say, no, no, it's not just a female thing. So, yeah. so that having, having um, self-confidence is really, really important and, and it's so tough when you're 12 yeah. <laughs> or, to, or 13, 14, 18, 20. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that there are so many factors that, that can worm their way in and undermine how you feel about yourself. Yeah. So the self-belief and the self-confidence I see is two very different things. And if you can match them, that's the ultimate outcome. Because again, you know, when, even in my daily job, you might, you'll be facing some difficult HR issue or someone will come to you with a really challenging query and you think, oh gosh, I haven't dealt with this one before. And mm. the first reaction is, oh, there must be some right answer to this. You know, if I if I knew better, I would have the right answer. But actually, right in a lot of these cases, there's no right answer. There's just common sense and you drawing on your experience to come up with an outcome that you're pleased with. And all of that requires self-confidence. So, so I think that would probably be the number one piece of advice <laughs> that I would give to yeah. myself because it's, it's pretty hard and, and looking at the way that, people are judged these days. If I was a 12-year-old with Instagram and Facebook and all those things, which didn't mm. exist when I was 12, mm. I would find that damn hard and, and even more of a challenge to my self-confidence. Yeah. I suppose it's like knowing yourself. I find that building confidence that is totally unshakable before actually you know what happens <laughs> or, or yeah, before you exactly. know what problem you're going to face next is 
kind of, I don't think it happens really in real life, but knowing that you can overcome confidence issues with uh, a little bit of determination, a bit of, um, um, you know, background to support you, a little bit of methodology in how you deal with problems. Yeah, uh, yeah. It seems to me that then you can deal with anything. And in fact, um, probably my last point would be, and this is something that, that I probably wouldn't need to give advice to myself because it is something that I've done, is this idea of going, if you go from the classroom to the boardroom or, you know, to go mm-hmm. to become an overnight celebrity, there's no fun in that. Yeah, <laughs> the, exactly. The, the, the actual <laughs> the journey fun is, <laughs> is, is the journey. And, and yeah. so that's, and, and I, I think... For me, I, I didn't. That, that wasn't one of my motivators. But the the young people in my life these days, you can see it's a real challenge. This idea of what is success, and it's like you know, mm. catastrophic. Not catastrophic. It, it's it's there's these ridiculously high profile people that have lots of followers on Instagram, or or that mm. are YouTube celebrities, oh, or yes. et cetera, et cetera. Robots. Yeah, and and so so for They're me, robots. I think the the journey that it's okay to do the lower level jobs and there's lots of fun in that and and yes it's um, once you end up in the boardroom you're very important and you have a lot of influence but you also have a lot of expectation on you and that can be really amazing but it can also be very stressful and and so the journey is also really really fun and that's where you're gathering together all of those skills that you then get to use when you're in the boardroom so, mm, exactly. so I would say, don't rush it. <laughs> try, try not to be too impatient, <laughs> but but don't rush it because there's so many things to gather along the way that are also just really awesome experiences that you will then use in your life forever. Exactly. Yeah, You're growing into the success. You're, yeah. It, some things take time. <laughs> you don't <laughs> just uh, you know uh, emerge <laughs> a successful person. No, you got to no. work on it. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, would you like people or do you mind if people get in touch with you? And if not, uh, what is your preferred method for uh, getting people to get in, in contact, perhaps ask you questions or have a conversation with you? Oh, yes. Um, so um, I'm a big fan of Twitter. <laughs> I yeah. mentioned earlier uh, this Twitter is, is awesome. a big, big platform for scientists. Um, we, we love to communicate that way and hope that yeah. people might like to listen to what we have to say. Um, so, so I have a Twitter handle, which is at Dr. Rebecca J, or via Instagram. So, so um, it's a, I have the same handle on Instagram, so it's okay, Dr. Great. Rebecca J. We'll put it up. So I, I would be delighted if people wanted to tweet things to me. Awesome. We'll put it in our show notes. Well, that was a very enjoyable conversation. Uh, it went really quickly and I think we are over time, so sorry about that. Um, I, I think your next appointment is uh, still waiting for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> so. It's like a doctor's surgery. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Rebecca, and um, uh, we'll be in touch. I'll, I'll be visiting the museum one time soon with my kids and uh, maybe can knock on your door if you're there. That would be awesome. Yeah, please let me know, Peter. <laughs> it was super fun talking okay. to you. All right. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, you too. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Rebecca are available on our website, txpod.com forward slash p forward slash stemiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a gold mine of information in the notes. This Timivest podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at pa at txplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.